when did you first meet Guthrie? I, I saw him first, thanks so much, uh, at the curtain call of A Midsummer Night's Dream at the Vic, which he did Tuppence Coloured with a very interesting cast. John, Johnny Mills was Puck. Uh, Richardson was bottom, Ralph Richardson was bottom, Robert Helpman was Oberon, Vivian Lee was Titania, uh, Alexander Knox, I think he was Canadian born actor, very good actor, was Snout. I don't know, it went on like that, so I threw, um, and I'd seen it, I saw it three times, and then I wanted to take my girlfriend to the last performance. It was the last performance of, his, of that production. It was it had revived over two years. It was hugely popular, and I had never seen Shakespeare uh, as a play, as a thing of anything great, of great fun before. I didn't know that it was incredibly funny, uh, and um, I, I, I went out to put a stool down for the pit, pit queue in the afternoon, but my girlfriend was late meeting me, and by the time we got to the pit queue, it had all gone in. The pit queue. It was a, called the, the pit. The lack, back part of the stalls was called the pit. And if you put a stool down for the pit it, by early, just to book it, because it was cheap, you could, you could uh, get in. Uh, and when people obviously had, well, came from work, just put it down during the day. And so I felt terrible, because I, I was not going to make it. So we wrote ran out of the gods, the up, upper circle, the top. And that was sold out, couldn't get in. So I was feeling just suicidal about this. And I went to the box office, and I spoke to a woman, a very nice woman there, who turned out to be, a, a, became a close friend after the war, Mrs. Clark, working in the box office at the Vic. And uh, she said, well, wait a minute, we can get you into two seats uh, in the Royal Box. She said, you can't see all the stage, but you can see into the wings, which is always interesting. <laughs> so we took them, and it was a, you know, a joyous night, and at the curtain call, uh, his honor came on, Guthrie, this tall, lanky, um, I think he fell over something on the entrance, but he looked, you know, he looked splendidly patrician and uh, big hands, and he smiled and all that sort of thing, and I, and I thought, he's just a fantastically creative person. Mm -hmm. He did this. And then I went to the war. I come back from the war, I get to the Arts Council thing with Beatrix Lehman, and Guthrie comes, hears about me and work, and comes to see me in Coventry. I did a production of, not the play you'd want anyone to come and see if they didn't want to desperately, of uh, The Doctor's Dilemma by Bernard Shaw. And uh, he was tremendously uh, uh, generous about it, talked to the company, and you know, they were all very thrilled he was there. And the next day was in the days of petrol rationing, petrol rationing. Um, I offered to drive him to Birmingham, but he wanted to go. And he said, is this, is this um, ration petrol, is this Arts Council petrol? <laughs> and it was all that sort of got me say, yes, but I haven't used it much, so we, we're all right, we'll get that. We got so well to, on together during the trip to Birmingham with he and his wife that uh, I said, look, where are you end ending up? And they said, we're ending it, but we're going to get a train to Bristol. So I said, I'll, I'll drive you to Bristol, what the hell? So we drove all the way to Bristol. And we became firm friends, three of us, from then on. Yeah. And uh, then he asked you, th coming to Stratford here, was that when the first? first I know, he asked me to do things. He came to see a lot of my work. And asked then you me came to do, to do Julius Caesar here in 1955? Yeah, before that, but I did things at the Vic. I did a play about Francois Villon for him, and I also did the production of Othello with Irene Worth as Desdemona. Douglas Campbell as Othello, Paul Rogers as Iago. And what would you describe Guthrie's sort of palette? Um, is he a man of intellect or heart or blood or passion or what's his palette, so to speak? I would put music first. I think he was a very, very musical man. And his interest in Shakespeare was in rhythms, not very much in the what lies underneath the poetry. I mean, that, in my experience of growing into a director, that was something that I learnt, the actual thing of learning to trust the author, to you know, trust him, just go with it and f see what happens. Learning that and learning 
that, that Shakespeare is not just for speech, it's not just rhetoric being uttered in a very sort of dramatic way. It is, that's empty rhetoric. It's filled rhetoric. In other words, it is continuous living thought. That when you start a Shakespearean phrase, you don't know how it's going to end. It's a journey you don't know. So it's suspended, and it, as opposed to live thought, where you've thought it already. That's dead, that's dead thought. Um, this became my uh, charge to anyone I worked with. This and the, a better examination of the text. From Guthrie, I got a much more theatrical feel of my, my, my theatrical, uh, whatever I possessed that way, was stirred by him. And to some extent, I tried to copy him. Um, in, you mean your theatrical, because different people have developed their own theatrical imaginations. I mean, the, I mean, talk about Jean Gascon, he has a yeah. very French theatrical imagination. You have, you know, you talk about Peter Brook and his yeah. kind of theatrical imagination. So y your formative time was actually going to theater before the war and then starting to create in the camps. Well, I was also, I, I went and played in plays in London with a, under an assumed name. Under an assumed name? Yeah. Which was? Eric Langham. Eric Langham. <laughs> Should I address you? I'm ashamed to say this. Well, I went to, well, walked on in things, you know, and I just played small parts in the wet arts. Thing. And I, I was still an article clerk, you know, meant, meant to be a, a student going to the law school. Why did you assume a name? In case my, my bosses, people I was the article too, found out. When I was in, when I was pr in prison, I'm, I'm in a book of Coward's, a thing of Coward's plays. Uh, you know, there's book collections in the little books of, and there's a play called Post Mortem, which had never been done before, which uh, we decided in one camp to do. And I was cast in a small, it was all about the, the anti-war play. It was rather sort of old fashioned pacifism, written in the early twenties by Coward. It had never been done. But some people in the camp I was in uh, want, wanted to do it, and they asked me to play a very young person called Babe Robbins, who uh, sort of, like rally in Journey's End, rather like that. And before we, we, got, we got a took permission from Coward to use it, Coward managed to get a first night message to us, you know, wishing us well for it. And uh, we played it for a week in the prison camp. And it's now, we've up the cast list is in the, this published version of Coward's plays. And under Babe Robbins, it says, Mike Langham. So that's fame for you. Mike. <laughs> now I'm going to call you Mike. Uh, or Eric. <laughs> or Eric. Or Mike. But when I ran the Glasgow Citizens, they called me the Mick. The Mick. <laughs> when did you run Glasgow Citizens? Well, after I went to, after I ran the Birmingham Rep. I ran uh, Coventry first, then the Birmingham Rep, then inadvertently the, the Vic and other things and going to Europe and doing things in Europe, and then I took on the Glasgow Citizens for one year. And uh, it was interesting work. They wanted to make a, an English rep of it, and I was wanting it to be Scots, you know, and so mm -hmm. given a lot of plays that had been lying around in the theater for years, never performed, we did. But I got to, it got very hot because of the, na the national, the uh, Scottish National Party started to think that I was, you know, one of, one of them, really. Mm -hmm. And they just pinched that uh, stone of schoon from Westminster and, and <laughs> They didn't tell me where it was, but anyway, when we left, we got uh, a nice tr uh, drums and pipes to see us over the station. Uh, when you came here, uh, Guthrie had been here, recruited, as it were, by Tom Patterson. But then uh, various design, I'm interested in the mix between sort of, I don't say indigenous Canadians who started to work at the festival, and the designers and the directors who sort of started it going, so to speak. The Desmond Healy's, the Brian Jackson's, uh, the Tanya Mozeevich's, the Michael, the Mike Langham's. <laughs> um, um, the, the, the idea well, originally was, was the, not, not to be, you know, the British coming in and taking over. That was very much against uh, Guthrie's instincts and wishes. Absolutely, that was not, this is not a takeover. This is to help something about Shakespeare happen in a Canadian setting. This was a Canadian enterprise, and I'm not the leader of this. The leader is Tom Patterson. That was his philosophy. That is what has got to be the statement about this. But we'll take over people who are good leaders, 
like Ray, Ray Diffin, one of the best cutters of costumes in, in the world. Uh, like Ray Diffin, Cecil Clarke, a very, very good uh, sort of administration, an administrator of theatre. Tanya is a designer. I, I forget how many Canadian designers or when Canadian designers were involved. I'm not sure there was anyone in the, in the first two seasons, but there certainly was during my time here. You've seen the new Globe Theatre in London, which is the attempt to recreate the Globe Theatre from Elizabethan times. What do you think of it? Have you been to see the performance? Yes, I don't care for it. Why? Uh, I think it's crude. I think it's not. Uh, it's based on a, a bit of false information. It's based on a sketch that was made on the back of an envelope by some Dutch tourist who went to see a show. And it's based on that. Well, about the, and, and so ever since we've thought this is the, this is the globe, we don't know. I mean, the wonderful thing about Shakespeare and everything to do with Shakespeare is a, it's a mystery. It's a great, gigantic, magnificent mystery. And we know the stage had a lot of capacities because there was a terrific quality standard of carpentry in those days. And whatever they could do and make for, for, for stage effects, they'd make. We know that the stage was uh, partly in the open air. The Globe was, certainly. The Blackfriars was closed in. That was a theatre that they used a lot in the latter part of his life. But uh, we don't know the real dimensions of it. I mean, you, you couldn't tell from the, from the ruins as much as you could tell about the Rose Theatre. When that was revealed, it, the, the rake of the, st of the seats was... A, it fascinated me that I discovered the rake of the seats was such that the middle level of a house which is where the bedrooms would be in Romeo and Juliet, was equivalent with the middle of the auditorium. So that, the, and, and when you go down to the vaults of the last part of Romeo, that was equivalent with the, with the, with the bottom of this long rake. Uh, I never knew that was the case, that the, that the, the uh, seats were raked so much, and consequently the structure of the stage was probably raked so much. Have you seen the performance in the Globe? In London? Yes. And what did you think of the performing style in the daylight outdoors? I thought that uh, quite a bit of the acting that I saw was, was okay. Uh, but I suppose, in a sense, that was a change from a lot of Shakespeare that one sees. Because, like it or not, the Globe is going to set an imaginative idea of what Shakespeare was like in 1602. It's just going I to do that. I suppose so. And people will go, well, I think, oh, I yes. think there's, a, there's a production on a, of Lear at the moment where the, the groundlings really see, feel involved with this old man as he goes through the trials of the storm scene. And, and it, it, it really makes contact with them and shares it with them. And so that the, they are sharing his, the experience. Well, that's, I think, what it should be. Mm. But I hadn't seen that happen at the Globe with the visits I've made. I'm just talking about what I hear about this summer. Right. Yeah.